command of a ranger battalion. I thought one of the greatest privileges I ever had was commanding a battalion in Hawaii, you know, and everything. And now I, you know, take command of 3rd Ranger Battalion. And as I've said, you know, yeah, it was under tough circumstances because of the friendship I had with uh, John who passed away with the helicopter crash. But, you know, I still knew that what John would want me to do and John would want me to just pick up just like he was there, you know, and everything. And uh, so I, I did that. And having those little meetings with officers separate from NCOs and sergeants and stuff, that, that was very important to me to do. And uh, I, I did something that uh, with the officers it was sort of easy, you know, it really was. With the NCOs, sometimes they get a little defiant on you a little bit. And when I was talking with them, it was very uh, unique uh, for them because I did something they, they said they'd never heard anybody have to do before. And that was when I said, okay, I want y'all to understand something that you have to do. And I said, You're, you guys are great at what you do. There's no doubt, but there's something I want you to help me with. I want to be able to know that when I come out to training and it's two o'clock in the morning and dark, I want to know who the ranger is that's laying down there beside his buddy. And I want to know who he is. I don't want him just be ranger. I want to know who he is. I expect every one of you platoon sergeants, and a platoon sergeant, sergeant first class, has about 45 rangers in that in that platoon. And uh, I said, I expect you as the platoon sergeant to remember they're not just rangers. They're your kids. And I expect you to know their first name and their last name. I expect you to know if they're married or single. And if they're married, I expect you to know the wife's name and if they're kids, the kids' names. And if they're single, I expect you to know mom and dad's name so that you can relate to them. And they thought I had lost my mind, in all honesty. They said, sir, we've, we've never had to do anything like that. I said, I know. I understand. But I'm not worried about what you did before. I want you to do it this way. I said, because when I go out at training at night, I want to crawl up beside that young ranger. And I want you to have already told me who it is so I can say, hi, Ranger Smith. How's it going tonight? And I did that quite a few times, and it was amazing because they, as soon as they heard my voice, they said, Sir, why, why are you out here? I said, because you're out here. This is where I should be. And then if it's one that's married, I say, how's your wife? How's Mary doing? Because I've already been told by the sergeant. See, I did that, and some people think that gets too personal. Well, it, it, you have to have your own way. And my way was I really wanted to make them understand how important they were and that it wasn't just them. We're a gigantic family. And when you're a big family, you've got to know each other. And it was, it was amazing because I can fast forward to some of them who retired. Every one of them retired as command sergeant majors. That's the kind of people I had. That's the highest rank you can have as a non-commissioned officer, command sergeant major. And I remember one of the times when I got... Uh, came back and uh, they were still in 3rd Battalion. I had given up command, etc. and I come back and three of them got me to the side one night. It was at a big barbecue thing there at Fort Benning. <laughs> and I was there at it, my wife and I. And uh, <laughs> they walked over and said, Sir, we need to talk to you about something. I said, Oh, okay, here we go again, huh? And uh, went back to the old days, I thought. They said, Do you remember that thing you made us do? when we were platoon sergeants about the soldiers and we thought it was a little too personal. I said, yep. They said, we all have to admit we did the same thing when we became command sergeant majors because we found out it really does make a difference. So that was to me one of the greatest accolades I ever got from my people to say that you, you, you made us do it. We didn't want to do it, but we figured out that it was the right thing to do. So that all happens. And so now I've met with them and I've met with the officers, so I feel good about everything. When I took command there in uh, uh, the 1st of February, 8th of February was the day, on March the 1st, 3rd Ranger Battalion was going to South Korea for an exercise. Now how fortunate that is for me, because everything's already planned, I'm the new commander. 
I take command in February. We're going on the 1st of March to Korea. And I, they briefed me on what the exercise was supposed to be like and everything that Colonel Keneally had done. And they said, sir, do you want us to change anything? I said, nope. This is John's plan. He's not here, but we're going to execute it just like he's got it planned. And I said, that's what I expect us to do. And I was thoroughly briefed, and I knew everything that needed to be done. But it was John's plan, and we're going to execute John's plan. And so we did. We go to Korea. We uh, flew from Fort Benning to uh, McCord Air Force Base in Seattle, Washington, changed planes, got on C-141s, and flew to uh, South Korea. And en route, we rigged to jump out of perfectly good airplanes. <laughs> and we flew in there at uh, Pohang, and we jumped. Uh, everybody was rigged, and we jumped in to a gigantic rice paddy. And at that time of the year, in March, it's still pretty cold over there and wet. And uh, we jump in and uh, only had two soldiers that I felt they could get hypothermia because they were soaked. So I wouldn't let them go. Because when we jumped in, we didn't go in. We had a target, a mission to hit two and a half days later. So we get there, we throw our parachutes in the back, throw them over to the side, and we had people there to pick them up, no problem. And here we go to go hit this target. Two and a half days later, we got a hit. And the mountains in South Korea are very challenging, you know. So we start walking, and there was a great uh, thing going on in terms of, let's see if he's really as good as he says he is. There was an evaluation going on, and it was one person being evaluated by 900 soldiers, my rangers because I stayed with them the whole time. I promise you that was unique to them. He's the new commander and he jumped in with us, but he didn't go back to the operations tent. He's out here with us walking and it was cold. It really was. So I knew that there was an evaluation taking place for two and a half days, but I started with them and I did it with them. And that was the, the rule I had as long as I was with them. Whatever they do, I'm going to do with them. And I promise you, that was a gigantic team builder for me with them. It really was. Would John have done that? Yes, without question. Mm -hmm. Would Kim have done it? Without question. I knew those guys that well that I know they did. I had a boss that wouldn't have done it. Okay. Uh, that's when he was a battalion commander, this guy was, and I was the XO. I would do, but he wouldn't do. And, you know, that, that has an impact on the people you're leading. It really does. Because what it, it doesn't change what they can do and how good they can do it. They just sort of look at him as, well, that's not who I want to be. And so, you know, his name's unimportant. I'll never forget, there was only two battalion commanders in my entire career that I didn't, or commanders I didn't get along with. And uh, one of them was a lieutenant colonel, one of them was a colonel. But, you know, I, I didn't even mention them in my book, you know. They don't deserve to be mentioned. But anyway, that's, that's what we do. We, three weeks later, we come back uh, to Fort Benning. And uh, how lucky was I to have had three weeks of nobody except my people being there. The commander of the regiment did. Uh, when I took command of 3rd Battalion, it's another little interesting tidbit to put in. Uh, the regimental commander of the Ranger Regiment that passed the colors to me was a colonel by the name of David L. Grange. General Grange's son was my regimental commander. Oh. The general that I was with in Korea, mm -hmm. that I spent you know, there and Fort Benning time, his son was the regimental commander of, of the Ranger Regiment when I take command of 3rd Ranger Battalion. How lucky could I be, you know? Not only work for a great father like he was, but his son as well. And his son retired as a one-star. And just great, great guy. So it, it's so unique. And, and I, I look back sometimes, and I think about the exact things we're talking about. And how could I be so lucky, you know? 
to have these opportunities and, and everything. And uh, so when we did the exercise, Colonel Grange, he jumped in too with his guys, with his small element. He didn't wasn't telling me what to do or anything. He just wanted his guys, a smaller element obviously, you know, it's a regimental headquarters of people, smaller by far, but he wanted to be there. And I thought it was great because he could critique me if necessary, you know. And so we, we got along great, really did. How fortunate could I be, you know. So anyway, uh, we do that and then we just pick up and start doing regular training and everything like you're supposed to do every day. And uh, one of the things they learned very early about me, I had really learned it from General Grange, watching him in Korea. General Grange over there had a requirement for everybody in the division of the Second Infantry Division of 20,000 soldiers. You would do a road march, a 12-mile road march, every quarter, and that was his requirement. Now, generals are real good at putting requirements out. And there's two kinds of generals. Put requirements out and don't do them, but they make the requirements. And there's generals, very few, that put them out and do it. General Grange was what I learned from. He believed that his requirement for everybody to do a 12-mile road march every three months was very important so that he should do it too. And so I always had to have on my calendar units that were doing road marches and usually AI would always pick one out and tell him ahead of time. I remember one time he walked by my desk so he said, Danny, he said, I haven't done a road march this month. I said, sir, I got it covered, don't worry. And so I would always call the unit that, that I told him was going to go and at five o'clock that morning you're at that unit and he road marched with them. But what was amazing about it and it was probably the first great education I got from him, don't do don't ask people to do something you can't do. So he's out there road marching. He's the two-star general. Same equipment the soldiers have on. And so he's road marching. He starts at the front. He stays up there about five minutes and then the commander, you know, he talks to him and then he starts walking back. He goes about halfway back and he starts talking to every soldier individually as he walks up. Just talking to him. Then when he gets to the front, he'll say something to the commander. It could be a company commander, battalion commander, it doesn't matter. And then he'll go all the way to the back and walk all the way forward, talking to all of them again. So our 12-mile road march was usually 16. And the man could walk forever. Unbelievable. And uh, it, it, it taught me something called respect for those people you're leading. And that's a big word to me. If you want to be respected as a leader, as a commander, you need to earn that respect because they're not going to give it to you easy. And the best way to earn it is never ask them to do anything that you can't do. I learned that from General Grange. And then I've got his son as my commander when I take command of 3rd Battalion. It, 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 people, I say, talk about this sometimes to people, and they say, are you really telling the truth about all this you did? I said, honest, honest to God, I promise you, I know it's right, <laughs> you know? And that's what I, when I did write my book, there was things in there like that. Mm -hmm. And so here I take command and we're doing this and training's going great, everything's good. PT, when we get physical training in the morning, I'm standing right there and I go over here and do PT with this squad over here and the Sergeant Major goes over there and does it with that squad there. And my guys, when they saw me coming, they loved it because I really believe this. They absolutely wanted to, me to be with them because they wanted to try and hurt me. I knew what they wanted to do because these guys were, I mean, they're studs. And I don't care if you're the 19-year-old ranger or you're the 39-year-old ranger. They're studs. They're mentally and physically tough. And I promise you, every time they wanted to challenge me and see, could I do what they were doing? And they finally found out, especially about running, that I could smoke every one of them if I needed to. And I, I love running. I've done 27 and a half marathons, 12 marathons, three ultra marathons, 62 and a half miles long one time. So I, I, I really loved it. And they were the ones that made me better because if I couldn't be better and be with them, I shouldn't be there. Land, we're on them and we go to Fort Bragg. 
We get to Fort Bragg, General Garrison has already gone forward to Mogadishu to interface with the UN element over there. Uh, and that was fortunate for us. There was an American two-star general, General Thomas Montgomery, who was the overseer of all of the UN forces, including American forces, you know. That was a blessing in many ways. If it had been a foreign, if there was a foreign three-star, he came one time. <laughs> so that was a blessing in the long run. But anyway, General Garrison's gone over there with his group to start interfacing and figuring out what to do, what's going on, etc. We get briefed by his deputy commander. He calls just the leadership in. And he said, okay, there, this is what's going on. There's been some changes to the task force. And we're all sort of stunned. What do you mean changes to the task force? He said, well, they've given some guidance that we have to deal with that we really don't want to and didn't want to, but we have to. He says, uh, first thing is this. We had 551 people trained and ready to go on this mission. Counting my guys, Delta guys, aviators, etc. 551. He says, task force ranger has been capped now at 450. They took 101 people out of our task force. And yes, I was one of the people that raised my hand quickly and said, why? That's stupid. And the answer was, they didn't want this to look like a buildup similar to Vietnam. Now, any Vietnam veteran would hear that and say, you have got to be kidding. But that was exactly the words they used. They didn't want it to look like a buildup similar to Vietnam. Every American knows there's no similarity between fighting in Mogadishu, Somalia, and fighting in Vietnam. None. That was a move, I think, to make it very challenging for us. But we are special operators. We have brains that are very, very strong, and we're going to find a way to do this. Delta Force didn't lose any of theirs. That other platoon of 45 that I had out of A Company, they didn't go. They sat right there. And the day we left, I made them stay there for three days because I knew the exercise was going to be over, and then they could go home instead of going back to Fort Bliss. But you want to talk about 45 really angry young men? That's 45 of them right there. And that 45 could have made a difference. There's no doubt. Aviators, the number of helicopters that they show in a movie or anything like that is right. There was no extras. And usually you have extra helicopters. You have a spare or two in case something goes down one maintenance wise. No, there was no spare helicopters. So the maintenance had to be really, really good because they had to use those helicopters. So we now have gotten down to that 450 okay which was a real shame uh, the staff size went down made much longer hours for people to do things so anyway uh, so we do that and we get over there and uh, General Garrison briefs us on what's going on and he says we got to be ready to go so we we land there and everything and people back in the states still don't even know we're there which is okay. We don't want them to know we're there, really. You know, uh, my wife and, and none of the ladies and back there knew. And I had told the soldiers that we're going to go back. You don't open your mouth about one thing. It'll happen sooner or later. Don't worry, but don't open your mouth. So we land that day, uh, the plane I'm on, and uh, I get off. Or no, I, before I get off, I'm standing there getting my gear together, and this UN guy comes on board. He's an American soldier. I guess American uniform, but he had a blue beret on which means you win and so he gets on the plane goes to the cockpit and then he comes out he says Colonel McKnight here and I said right here he says uh, sir I need to talk to you a minute and he introduced himself he was uh, a major Rick Stockwell as I would call the name and he says uh, sir uh, I need to talk to you a minute he said uh, you need to get off the plane with me first uh, just you and I uh, and I said why he said well uh, the media is out there waiting to interview you. Excuse me? I said, he said, the media is out there to interview you. I said, how do they know? He said, it was announced on the nightly news last night that the Special Operations Task Force had departed from Fort, Bragg, from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, most likely headed to Somalia. I said, yeah, that really made a lot of sense, didn't it? And, he's, and it was un unimportant who said it. 
you know, because probably every station had it anyway. So it didn't really matter to me that part. So I had to get off with him and, you know, sort of tell them. They didn't get asked. I sort of told them what we were doing. And then one, they had one question, and one question was asked was, are you really here to capture Muhammad Faradid? And my response to that was, I'll put it this way, if we see him out there on the streets, yes, we will capture him in the conversation. We all get off and we move into a hangar that uh, we had to clean all the rats and everything out of it first, but we got that done and that's where we lived for most of the time we were there. Uh, then we did have some other places we would try to separate like me and you know the commanders from the, all the soldiers. But it was a great task force of 450 people, but it should have been 551 like we planned. Because General Garrison's pretty smart. He knew what he was doing. So anyway, uh, we do that, and uh, then we started operations soon after that. And I think a lot of people failed to know that or, or pay attention to it. We did a total of seven operations over there. People only talk about one, and that, of course, was the last one when people were killed, helicopters were shot down. But we did six before that. We had captured his most important guy. His most important guy was captured by us. Actually, the Delta guys took him down in a convoy. And see, people don't want to pay attention to that. But that had a big impact because things changed for a deed then because of that. Because this is the money guy, so now you've got a problem. And then on October 3rd and 4th, we were supposed to capture two key people. There was a total of 25 in that building. And we captured the two key people and kept them alive all the time. People do not seem to understand how important it was what we did and how well those young men did fighting that battle that day. And that bothers me a lot. And again, that's what was what the inspiration was for me to choose to write a book about it. After those, uh, those two operations, how many losses were there there? How many what? How many losses? How many losses did we have? Yes. Uh, we only had minor wounds before October 3rd. Nothing serious, nobody had to be evacuated. Never was anything serious. Uh, on that day, I lost six Rangers, five Delta operators died, and five aviators died. There were 16 that died that day. There was one more of ours that was killed on October the 7th when a stray mortar round was fired in from the bad guys into a hang into close to the hangar and Matt Ryerson, it landed this far behind him and killed him after he'd fall all the way through October 3rd and 4th. So uh, we uh, did that and uh, you know the battle itself was, I, there's no win or lose, that's not what it's about, but if we had had those other things, like that AC-130 gunship up there that also was taken away from us, that's the reason it wasn't there. It was trained for, we used it in training. And General Garrison was told, no, you can't have it. We're worried about collateral damage. Collateral damage, the whole place is collateral damage. Again, a political decision made to, for some reason that I can't even understand in my wildest dreams. But I always look at just a few people to blame for things, and I start with the Commander-in-Chief because he makes the decision. A bad thing for us was General Colin Powell. He retired. General Powell retired August the 1st of 1993. We got alerted late August of 1993. General Charlie Kashabili became the next chairman, but that takes time for him to get, you know, up to speed per se. And I don't know that he was involved with the decision of reducing. I don't think he was, because uh, I know him well too, and he's a pretty sharp guy. And I can't imagine that he would say, oh yeah, we'll reduce the force. So those kind of things are, are the impact that you see happening on the ground. I can always say that my Rangers, from the 18 year olds, which I had two, to you know me at 42 years old, those guys down there were the greatest fighters I've ever seen in my life. Because outnumbered, <laughs> way outnumbered we were. But it is true, we don't leave anybody behind. And what the two Delta operators did at that second crash site, they gave their life. And they ended up saving Mike Durant's life. Everybody else, unfortunately, was taken away and killed. So to, losing 16 that day was tough. 
It was in the 17th one, you know, a few days later. And there was also two from the 10th Mountain Division who were with the United Nations Force. Okay, they were part of that. But they had two of their people killed too. They came out and fought their tails off with us. They really did. And Bill David, who was their battalion commander, great friends we are because we'd never met until then. But when you go through that, you become friends. So. How close were you to that action? I, uh, best way to answer that is uh, the people that have seen the movie, which is the best way to say it, there were the Humvees going through the streets. The lead vehicle, I was in the front right seat of the lead vehicle. And it got shot up pretty bad. Uh, it just so happens that it's in this museum now. That's where I wanted it to be. Uh, one of my soldiers had it for 22 years and he was fine, trying to find a way to give it to me. But for a long time, I wasn't around where he could give it to me. And then we met in Tampa, Florida, Florida State University, South Florida football game, and he had it in his car and gave it to me. And I knew where I wanted it to be, and that's the reason it's in this museum. And uh, it's a, a piece of history, is what it is. But he held on to it for 22 years, 22 years. So uh, it, it, uh, it, it'll get your attention. You know, and that's where I was, and that's when I got wounded. Was in in that process. Uh, well, be specific. What was uh, the wound? My wounds. I took uh, shrapnel in the arm and in the neck. Uh, you know, uh, I medicked myself. Were you able to continue? Then? I was able to continue. I medicked myself. We didn't stop the convoy. You know, we kept doing what we had to do. In the movie, and people ask me the question a lot, it shows you, you, Tom Sizemore, the actor, getting out and walking up and down when the things, you know, vehicles are shot or something. Did you really do that? I said, yeah, I really did that. And I said, they said, what did your soldiers think of that? I said, well, I, I think they were pretty busy, so they didn't really worry about it too much. But I will tell you that many of them later on told me that I had, I had no idea how many times I came close to really being shot bad because if you're walking around trying to get people moving and get people that are wounded and shot and all that, you focus on that. There's nothing heroic about what I did. I was simply leading some of the finest war fighters I've ever seen in my life and I was leading my part and that's what I was supposed to do. Did you have at that point in time any idea how large the opposing force was. What, what were you dealing with? We knew that they outnumbered us tremendously. We knew that they weren't great war fighters. So we used that in our favor because we are, they're not. They just like to assault in big groups. They like to run at you 25 or 30 at a time. They have handguns, they have AK-47s, they have RPGs. So they have that capability, but we have better capability. And had we not had the better capability, we would have lost a lot more. And I look at something today that we have done for our soldiers, and we protect them better when they're in the top of a vehicle now. There was nothing protecting my young men behind 50 caliber or Mark 19s. Nothing around them to protect them. And that is when I lost a couple of my guys. The 50 caliber is mounted on a turret of the Humvee. Oh, uh, the Humvee. It's yeah. up on the top of the... Yeah. Was that the largest weapon you carried in there? That was the largest. We had, you know, laws, you know, light armored type vehicles, but we didn't need them. They didn't have armor. You know, we could take care of it with 50 caliber. 50 caliber and the Mark 19, which is like a hand grenade type round. And it is phenomenal. And we really, really nailed a lot of things with that. And... The, it's just unfortunate the the young men that got wounded being in the top of the turret because they had no protection. And Sergeant Mike Pringle was one of them. I mean, one night on our second mission that we went out on, a round hit here right by, grazed his head, went around the back of his helmet and fell out. I told his mother that... He survived? He survived. Oh, yeah. He just had a slight wound. And I... When I talked to his mother uh, and dad, and I asked him how did they react when they found out about that, and his mother looked at me and says, 
I knew he was. That day when it was all over, uh, October 3rd and 4th, uh, we got most uh, everybody in, a lot of people in on the 3rd, but on the 4th we had everybody in except the ones that were taken away from the helicopter, the second helicopter that went down. And that was, you know, Mike Durant was saved by Randy Shugart and Gary Gordon. And they went back out there to try and get the others out, and by that time there were so many Somalis coming at them, it was unbelievable. And uh, uh, Ray Frank, who was the co-pilot, he was alive. The crash didn't kill anybody. The two crewmen, Tommy Fields, Bill Cleveland, the crash didn't kill them. They were killed because they were taken out of there by the Somalis and awfully, awfully treated and killed. And Randy Shugart and Gary Gordon, same way, they went in there to help and they died too. And that was just at that helicopter, there's five people. That day totaled out at, uh, you know, uh, my six, five Delta and five aviators, that's 16 to Tenth Mountain and then one that died later, so a total of 19 casualties. And when you think about 19 casualties though, compared to how many people were shooting at us, which I promise you the number exceeded a thousand people that were firing, firing at, shooting at us at different times, uh, it's, it's amazing that more didn't die. It really is. Uh, as far as wounded, I think the, the total number was right up around 80-something. Uh, that were wounded in one way or another. I mean, I was wounded, but I couldn't, I was still competent. I could still do what I had to do, and I had a lot of them that were like that. So I, I guess in a way, we were fortunate that we only, only had 19 killed because it could have way been higher. There's no doubt about it, no doubt. So I, I look at that, and then the next thing we have to do is board planes and go back home, you know? And uh, we get back, and we arrived at Fort Benning, our plane of my guys, and I've looked at that, and uh, it was a lot smaller than it should have been. But we did have the ones that were wounded that we'd already got out of there. And so it was a really small force, unfortunately. And so uh, we have a nice little welcome and everything, and then, uh, you know, 